Okay, we're coming to the last in the series tonight in which we've been on for the last three weeks. This is the fourth week on the four faces of the sons of God, the profiles of God's people in the end time. The four faces uh, of the sons of God and we've been taking our text from Ezekiel chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 4. Where both in Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 4 it portrays four faces of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we've been looking at those progressively. We looked at the face of the uh, eagle, the characteristics of the eagle. Uh, the eagle has, has to learn to catch the currents, catch the spirit, the rise in it. Learning to catch, learning to set your wings, to catch the spirit. And... Uh, uh, he is at his best in the times of storms. Uh, he can just rise above it, rise into the realms of the spirit. It's quick, and it can kill very quickly. Now we looked at the area of, um, one of the faces was the face of a man. Predominant face of a man. Primary a man. A fourfold nature, or a threefold nature uh, of the man is the eagle, uh, the ox, and the lion. But predominantly he was a man and so we looked at that, why he, it is a man and so on. We won't go into that again tonight. And last week we looked at the ox and the ox speaks of service. It is a pastoral service orientated uh, ministry. We looked at three levels of service last week, three different levels um, of service. Now tonight, I want us to go on and we're going to complete this series on looking at the fourth characteristic, and that is a lion. Okay, there's a tremendous contrast between the ox and the lion. I mean, they're just not remotely alike. Um, there's a tremendous contrast between, in fact, all of these uh, manifestations of various, these profiles of... Um, characteristics of God's people in the end times, the sons of God in the end times, there is a, a difference. God doesn't seek to blend these divine natures. Um, each is separate and distinct, though they all can be housed in one uh, person, one body. Uh, there is no conflict between them. They are distinct. They don't usually interrelate together. They operate usually separately that there is no conflict, and there is a tremendous difference, a tremendous contrast between the ox, which we talked about last week, and the lion, which we're talking about um, this week. One of the faces was the face of a lion, and um, always being a man, but with certain characteristics portrayed um, in these animals. And it can be that... Um, one animal characteristic, you may predominate one of these characteristics, but they should all be there. One may predominate, um, and tonight we're going to look at this area of a lion. The, the scripture, the word of God, portrays or pictures the lion in a number of ways. Firstly, it's one of the names of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation 5 and verse 5, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And there are other reference to that. It is one of the names of the Lord Jesus. He's referred to as a lion. Satan also is referred to in the scripture as a lion, but it is a counterfeit. As Satan goes around as a roaring lion, as seeking whom he may devour. And um, we need to be aware of that. He is there. There is a counterfeit there. And he is an imitator. I have a friend, Bob Mumford, who um, he in the ministry a number of years ago, he had a dream about um, he was he was uh, facing some problems in a situation, and he was these situations were getting on top of him. He didn't know how to handle it, and um, he uh, had this dream, and in this dream he couldn't go from the room to a room where he needed to get because every time he walked out into the passage there was a tremendous roar of a lion in that room. And uh, he was always frightened. You know, how was he going to get into that room where he had to go into to continue on with his life? And um, 
he had to get out of one room to another. But every time he came out into the passage, there's this tremendous roar. And for ages and ages and ages, um, he was afraid to go into that, into this other area. And, um, finally in the dream, he came to the conclusion, well, I'm gonna, if I'm gonna get out of where I am, if I die, I die. Um, I know there's a lion in there. And so he came out for the last time into the, into the passageway. This lion was roaring like anything. And he stepped into the room and there were two loudspeakers. And the, the roar was coming through two loudspeakers. Now that portrays the devil. He's all shout. He goes around as a lion. He isn't a lion. He goes around as a lion. Somebody said he's a lion with all his teeth pulled. Well, I don't know about that, but he goes around as a lion. He is a counterfeit of the real. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay, now the characteristics of the lion. The lion in scripture always speaks of authority, strength, and power. Authority, strength, and power. In the book of Proverbs, in chapter 30 of Proverbs, in verse 30, it reads like this. Let me just read it to you. Proverbs 30 and verse 30, speaking of the lion, it says this, that uh, a lion which is strongest among the beasts, he turneth not away for anyone. Okay, a lion which is the strongest among the beasts, he turneth not away for any. And so the pic- this picture which the Bible portrays of the lion is the strongest of any of the beasts here. And so his first attribute is strength. Tremendous strength, tremendous power. Real uh, strength. The strongest among the beasts. He has tremendous strength. That is one of the basic characteristics um, of a lion. And it's a something which God has to bring us into. Strength. Strength. The strength of a lion. It says he doesn't turn away for anyone. One of the characteristics that goes with the lion is the phrase, he is king over all the beasts. He is a, it's kingship. He's a, he's at that level, a lion. And, uh, that's his first attribute. Now the Bible tells us in Ephesians 6 and verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And put on, and it goes on to say, put on all the armor of God, and then having done all, to stand. And that's a picture of what we're talking about. Being strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Learning to um, put on the whole armor of God. And growing strong. Keeping your spirit strong. You know, it speaks of Jesus in Luke 1 and verse 80. How then he grew. He grew. He became strong in spirit. He waxed strong in spirit. His spirit became stronger and stronger and stronger. When we're talking about strength, we're talking about in our spirit. Strength of spirit. Uh, a characteristic um, of a lion. And in these last days, it is important that you become and you remain strong in the Lord. It's a characteristic of a profile, if you like, of end time sons of God. If you don't become strong, if you don't become strong and remain strong, you're not going to survive the end times. It's as simple as that. If you don't become strong in your spirit, um, you're not going to survive in the end times. Growing strong and keeping your spirit strong, learning to handle the weapons, put on, putting on the whole armor of the Lord, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, then it says put on the whole armor of the Lord. Now having done all that, to keep standing. And it's a picture of, of strength, learning to handle the weapons, learning to uh, put on the armor, learning to grow up, become strong in spirit, become strong in your emotions. You see, emotions can let you down. Uh, becoming strong so you're not overwhelmed by circumstances and by situations so that you don't cave in under pressure. See, a lion just never caves in. No matter what's going on around him, he doesn't cave in, he just stands there. And nothing phases him. And he just kind of looks out on the scene and everything's happening around him and this can come and that and go. But he doesn't run away. He stands there. And um, I once came face to face with a lion in the Kalahari uh, uh, bush. 
And I tell you, they don't move for anybody. I backed off and he didn't. And we've been traveling all day and I needed to go into the bush. And uh, ten yards away was this lion just looking at me. And I thought, well, he isn't going to move. And I can wait, so I backed off, you know, <laughs> back into the truck. They don't move for anyone. They, they, that's their characteristic. And uh, being strong in the Lord and the power of his might. It's very, very important that you guard your spirit and keep it strong. If your spirit becomes weak, if your spirit becomes small, you're going to be overwhelmed by the enemy. First attack will be in your emotions. That will take you down. Despondency, discouragement will take hold. You'll be vulnerable and open to everything. You can't afford that. In the last days, one of the profiles of the sons of God is the face of a lion. And you've got to maintain a real strength in your spirit. You've got to grow strong and maintain your strength. Grow up in God and not easily move. Not as the scripture says, blown around with every wind of doctrine, every, everything that comes your way, but you're not moved. The lion is not moved no matter what is happening around him. There is a strength there. A spiritual strength, an emotional strength, a strength of will, a strength of character. Strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might. Jesus grew, waxed, the scripture says, strong in spirit, grew in his spirit. Remain strong. And uh, there are a number of things which affect our spirit, which you've got to guard. There are a number of things which cause your spirit to grow and become strong. And there are, you have to guard your spirit very, very carefully. The spirit is very sensitive and it's influenced very, very easily by outside stimuli and all kinds of things that are happening in there. You know, growing, the, the whole concept of growing. The scripture speaks of these The life that you have of Christ in you was first planted in you as a seed. You know, the seed of the word and then it grows depending on the ground and circumstances and situation. But it's portrayed as a seed and that's supposed to grow and mature. But some people never grow, they never mature, they never become strong in the Lord. And there are reasons for that. And like any seed that is planted in the ground, there are certain conditions which are necessary for that to grow strong and maintain its strength. You plant a tree, there are certain conditions. If that tree is going to be strong and healthy, there are certain there's an environment which is required to keep to grow that tree strong and to keep it strong. And it's the same in the spirit. It speaks of this life in Christ that we have is implanted in us as a seed. Born of God. Seed, you know the parable of the sower? The seed fell, falling into the ground. And um, to grow in the world in which we live, we need a kind of a, to grow healthy, we need a pollution-free environment. It's in the natural, you know, if you don't, pollution is one of the greatest problems with uh, a world today. Acid rain is killing off forests all over the place in Europe. Um, pollution creates a problem in growth, natural growth. And it's the same in the realm of the spirit. You've got to keep your spirit in a pollution-free environment. And the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things of the world. And um, your spirit is important. The things which pollute your spirit, we call this sanctification. Setting yourself aside unto God. Not even allow. You think of what, what kind of things pollute your spirit. Sure, we've got to live in a world. You can't get away from the world. But it's the things which by choice we allow which affect our spirit. And the whole world, the concepts of the world, the philosophies of the world, the spirits of this world, if we embrace that, uh, that environment, we live in that kind of environment, it's going to affect your spirit. We need right soil. You know, if it's... it's, it's It always boggles my mind how stuff grows in Western Australia. I just can't work it out. I've been trying to grow some daffodils for two years and they just don't grow. Because they're in sand, I guess. But they said they would grow in sand. There's nothing else but sand. They don't grow. I don't know what to do with them now. Dig them out and... I don't know. But there's no soil in Western Australia. Well, at least I haven't found it yet. But... um, You've got to fertilize it. and I've never heard of fertilizing lawns. 
We never fertilized them or watered them in New Zealand. They grew like mad. You come here, you fertilize a lawn. That's ridiculous. Why do you fertilize a lawn? It's just grass. It grows. But you see, the soil is the problem. See, your soil affects the growth, affects the health of anything. And it's so in the realm um, of the spirit. If you don't feed your spirit, it's going to remain, what? Weak. This is one of the major problems with Christians today. I'm talking about Pentecostal Christians, any kind of Christian. They don't feed their spirit on what? The Word of God. You know, it says, desire the Word of God that you might grow thereby. The Word of God. Feed him on the living Word. Now you know by now, because I've taught you enough, when you're talking about feeding on the Word, we're not talking about reading the Word, we're talking about feeding on the living Word, which is Christ coming to you through the Word. Encountering the Lord in the Word. The Rema, the quickened Word, that's what feeds your spirit. And if you don't spend time to get in a place where you're hearing the quickened Word and feeding your spirit on it, your spirit will be weak. You can raise your hands and clap your hands and shout hallelujah and do everything else, but your spirit is weak. And when your spirit is weak, you are vulnerable. You are not strong. You are open to spiritual germs, which are always floating through the air. And they're going to take you down, because your spirit is not strong. And it's so important that you feed your spirit on the living word. You daily feed your spirit. Don't go for two or three weeks without feeding your spirit. It's going to be in a sorry state. Your spirit has to be fed on the word in order to grow. Your spirit has to experience and counter the, the consciousness of his presence. The, you know, anything needs water. When you get water, it grows. That's the type of the spirit. The spirit that you live in the spirit, you're spirit conscious, you worship the spirit, wait on the Lord, experience the anointing of your spirit that keeps your own spirit strong. Your spirit needs exposure to the spirit of God. Because out of the exposure to the presence of God, there's a transference takes place from his spirit to your spirit. That's why waiting on the Lord, waiting in the presence of God in prayer, or just waiting in a conscious presence of the Lord, transference happens into your spirit. Your spirit becomes strong. It just begins to grow. I tell you, if you spend hours in the presence of the Lord, the conscious presence of the Lord, your aura is going to be out here somewhere. The presence of the Lord. You see, a transference takes place out of the realm of the spirit, the conscious presence of the Lord, into your spirit. And it becomes strong. If you don't do that, your spirit's going to become small and weak, and you become vulnerable. A characteristic of one of these sons of the face of the sons of God is that of a lion. Be strong in the Lord. It's all also important for you. You maintain a positive confession of what you are in Christ. When you know what you are in Christ by revelation, not because somebody told you, but by revelation, you know what you are in Christ, and you affirm that, it strengthens your spirit. Whereas in the other case, negativeness and that whole thing will bring it down. And so, there are things which you have to do. Praying in the spirit strengthens your spirit. These are spiritual things. You have to feed your spirit on the consciousness of his presence on encountering him in the word and your spirit becomes strong this is the major I am convinced this is the number one problem with Christians today is one this one area their spirits are weak they're just not feeding they're just not imbibing out of his presence the spirits are small the spirit is weak they get knocked over by everything that comes along Every little wind of spirit begins to touch their emotions and affect them. Their spirit is small. They vacillate up and down. They have problems. They have emotional problems and all kinds of problems because their spirit is weak. And there's no face of a lion there at all. So the enemy comes along and pushes you down any time he wants. Because there's a weakness in their spirit. 
An attribute of a lion is his strength. He is of great, he has great strength within his own spirit. And, uh, authority and strength and power within his own spirit. Secondly, the Bible speaks of a, a lion, an attribute of a lion as being valiant. That word is used in the scripture an awful lot. But in 2 Samuel 17 and verse 10, it reads like this. I'll just read it to you. 2 Samuel uh, verse 17, 2 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 10, speaks of being valiant as a lion. And, uh, and he also that is valiant, whose heart is the heart of a lion. And we have other reference to this, but we won't take time for it tonight. And he's, he also that is valiant, whose heart is the heart of a lion. That word valiant, uh, through the word of God, both in the Old and New Testament, the, the Hebrew has it, his, it's the same word that's used for the spirit of might. Valiant or mighty. You know, remember in, in, in Isaiah in chapter 11, it speaks of the seven anointings of the Lord, and one of them was the spirit of might. Remember the spirit of might came upon Samson, then he had a tremendous strength. The spirit of might came upon the three Hebrew children when they were thrown in the fiery furnace and they couldn't be destroyed. The spirit of might came upon David's valiant men and they did supernatural things. You know, it speaks of these guys who slew three or four, eight hundred men, one guy. That's supernatural. You can't do that in the natural. They were spoken of David's mighty men or David's valiant men. But it is always in reference to this word might, the spirit of might being upon them. The face of a lion, a characteristic of an end time son of God, is he knows at times the spirit of might. That anointing, that's an external anointing, not to do with his own spirit. This is an external anointing um, coming upon them, an anointing of power, tremendous power. It can be for defense, and we're going to need that in the end times. The... Um, it's for warfare. The spirit of might is the, is the anointing which is used in performing miracles. When Jesus performed miracles, he was clothed in the spirit of might. Not healings, but miracles. He was clothed in that anointing. And um, we have many, many references to this kind of thing right throughout the word of God. That people could not be destroyed because the spirit of might was upon them. Hallelujah. That's a fantastic anointing. It's an anointing which we are going to need to survive in the end times. Daniel and all these guys survived with the spirit of might. And it is a power, it is anointing, valiant or with the spirit of might. Okay, another attribute, the third attribute of the lion is that he knows no fear. There are um, many, many scriptures dealing with um, the lion and this, this kind of uh, characteristic where he knows no fear. And um, this is important. In Nahum chapter 2 in verse uh, 11, the prophet Nahum said, Where is the dwelling of the lions, the feeding place of the young lions? Where, where is the lion? Even the old lion, he walked and none made him afraid. And um, there are other references to this, that a lion doesn't know fear. Okay. Fear is one of the major problem. You know, there's a very, very interesting verse in, in, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 74, which reads like this in Luke 1, 74. Let me just read it to you. It says this, That he would grant unto you that you be delivered out of the hand of your enemies that you might serve God without fear. Okay? That he would grant unto you that you being delivered out of the hand of your enemies, that you might serve him, that is God, without fear. The lion doesn't know any fear. He isn't afraid of anything or anyone. He never backs off. He will never give ground. There's nothing in the animal kingdom which a lion is afraid of. It's a characteristic of a lion. And one of the things that we have to conquer is the giant fear. Fear has to be conquered in your life. 
as we come on down to these end times. And fear can take many, many kind of shapes and forms. But all fear has to come out of you. And there's only one thing that we should fear, and that is the fear of God, which is clean. A healthy respect for God. But fear, you see, a lion, one of the characteristics, he knows no fear. Fear must come out of us. Now, it's something which God wants to work in us in these last days. And it's a work of the Spirit which he wants to do. People have problems with fear. Fear of man. The Bible says the fear of man, what bringeth a snare. Okay? It will hinder you. The fear of man will stop you doing the will of God. The fear of man will stop you entering into the purposes of God for your life. What people think, that is coupled to another powerful spirit, and that is the spirit of pride. Why do you care what people think? Because you're proud. Alright? Those two spirits are linked together. The fear of man and pride go together. The lion doesn't care. He doesn't worry about the eagle up there screeching around. He doesn't give a thought about the ox down in the field. He just doesn't think about these things at all. He's a lion. Doesn't fear anything. The fear of man. This is the major problem. This is the thing which will stop you entering into God's purposes for your life. What people think. So we don't do it in case we make a mistake, we make a fool of ourselves. Of what will people think? It's a snare. Oh, it's, it's a very powerful thing. And most people are not free from it. And it's something, it's a giant in your life which God wants to bring you to terms with to face it honestly before God and deal with it. Fear of man. He doesn't fear any other beast. The fear of Satan, or the occult, can be a very real fear in people's lives. The fear. Fear of the occult. Fear of Satan. Fear of, fa fear of failure. Fear of the future. Fear of men. Fear of women. Fears. All kinds of fears. Problems. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 6 reads like this. Let me just read it to you. Hebrews 13. So that we might boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I will boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear, I will not fear what man will say unto me, or do unto me. See, fear really paralyzes you, stops you really doing anything. Fear will stop you moving in the gifts of the Spirit. Fear of being wrong will stop you moving in the gifts of the Spirit. Fear of not quite getting it right will stop you. It's a as a paralyzing force. Fear. And so Satan holds us in bondage to all kinds of fears. Often rooted in pride. Usually rooted in pride. But all kinds of fears. And God wants us free. He wants all fear um, to come out of us. It paralyzes you. When you think about fear, when you analyze fear as to really what it is, fear is a basic mistrust of God. You don't trust God, so we fear. That's really simply putting it in a nutshell. In 1 John 4 and verse 18, it reads like this. 1 John 4, um, 18, There is no fear in love. And it's talking about the love of God. But perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear has a torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Now what does that mean? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because, because fear is a tormenting thing, 
He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Fear. A husband fears or a wife fears of losing her husband to someone else. It can be the other way around. Fears. Fears of someone taking your place. All kinds of fears. What's the basis? What's the problem? Fear. Fear of the dark. If you live on your own, fear, you know, of all kinds of things. What is the basis of fear? Lack of trust in God. You say, well, that kind of oversimplifies it. But, that's the truth. He that feareth is not made perfect in God's love. Not doesn't understand that God's love doesn't trust God's love for them. You know, if you had a, say, a father who was always with you, and he was ten foot tall, and four feet wide, big, he loved you, he only wanted the very best for you, and he was always with you, how many of you know you wouldn't fear? You know, if anyone's going to say about anything about you, he'd really put them in their place. You don't have to fear anything or anybody because the Father's always with you and he loves you. This is what the scripture is talking about. If you really understand God's love for you, you don't have to fear. Because God only wants the very, very best for you and he's quite capable of bringing that to pass. He is quite capable of stopping the enemy, spoiling anything for you. He is quite capable of taking care of you. Once we have committed our way unto the Lord, commit your way unto the Lord, trust in Him, who is love, there is nothing to fear. The lion doesn't know any fear at all. The lion is fearless. And we've got to come to the place, God has to deal with the fears in our lives. If we have fear in these end times, as we come on down to the end, in any area, the enemy is going to capitalize that on that, paralyze us, and we're not going to survive the end times. He will capitalize on it, paralyze you in that area, set it up, so that he keeps freezing you, paralyzing you, and you can't move. You have to be free from fear. Fear of failure. Fear of making a fool of yourself. Fear of man. You have to be free from fear. Or we're not going to survive. He'll capitalize on it on the end times and he will freeze you with it. The enemy will paralyze you with it. Committing your way unto the Lord and trusting in him. Learning to trust God. Learning to understand God's love, the perfect love for you will cast out fear. But there's a two-way arrangement there. It's committing your life into the hands of God and trusting him with your life. How many of you know the enemy cannot take your life once it's in the hands of God until it's God's time? How many of you believe that? He cannot take your life until your course is run. Okay? He can't do it because it says that Jesus has the keys of death and hell. The enemy cannot do that to you. If you commit your life into the hands of the Lord, trust in him, you belong to him, he can't take your life. He goes around roaring. <gasps> I've got cancer. I know I've got cancer. Fear. It's just a roar. There's no cancer there at all. It's just in your mind. Fear. It makes an inroad into your life through fear. Some of you have problems of the past which have created fears which you need counsel and deliverance from so that you can be free from fear. Things that happen in childhood. Ex- bad experiences. Things that happen and, 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 and unfortunate things. And at that point of time, as, as a, when you were young, that can create a tremendous um, traumatic experience which opens the door for a spirit of fear which operates just in that area coming into your life. See, a lot of women are frigid because they fear men because they've been attacked when they were young, sexually uh, molested or attacked or something, and when they grow up, they can't bear a man touching. There's fear. What has happened? Something happened when they were young, a trauma, 
they grow up and they kind of that goes on through their life. They grow up and as they grow old and trying to establish a relationship with someone, then that fear surfaces. A very, very real thing. And it's a spirit that took hold in childhood. You can be locked in a cupboard as a kid, as a punishment. And, and in the trauma of that, and in the dark and in the trauma of that, a spirit can enter. You have a fear of confined places, or a fear of the dark. So you get into a lift and you feel kind of confined, and you, you all these phobias, they're really just fears, phobias of fears, have roots back into our childhood. And you need counsel, and you need deliverance from those spirits which control you. And it's important that you get free from fear. Because if you don't get free from fear, in the last days, it's going to trip you up. God's going to have his people in these last days totally fearless. So the enemy can't touch them. It's afraid of nothing. So that the enemy can't touch them. It's a characteristic um, of the lion uh, being free from fear. We can say a lot on that tonight. But all of us at some level of fears. I, uh, you know, but God wants to get us free from that. Totally free. And so you've got to expose that area of your life, that fear. You've got to expose it to God. You've got to be honest with God and say, God, this thing is here. I don't know how it's gotten a hold of me, but it's here. I don't know where it's reached out yet, but it's here. We've got to get this fear out of my life. It's a spirit. And it, need, it needs some revelation, some exposure to the Holy Spirit to break it. And then you're free. Some people cannot do certain things because of fear. Now, that's a bondage. It's a spirit. And when it breaks in your life, whew, you are free. Fear. Bringing us to the point where we are fearless. I've got to move quickly. The fourth attribute is of a lion is bold. Boldness. And it's um, Proverbs 28 and verse 1. There are many other scriptures, but I'm just giving you one of each tonight in Proverbs 28 verse 1 the wicked flee when no one pursueth but the righteous are as bold as a lion the righteous are as bold as a lion this word um, boldness in both in the Hebrew and the Greek always relates to speech it's not just an attitude it relates to speech always relates to speech in the Greek and the Hebrew boldness uh, of uh, of speech. Uh, we have an example of that in Acts chapter 19 and verse 8. I'll just read it to you. But there are hundreds of examples in the Word of God. Um, Acts 19 and verse 8, Paul says, And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. And it's related to speech. Speech. There are times when God needs a leader, God needs a person with whom he can roar through. Now understand what I'm saying? Sometimes God wants to roar because he's a lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah. And there are times when um, God wants to roar in power and strength and in um, authority. And this Boldness always relates to speech. In Amos 1 2 it says, The Lord shall roar out of Zion. And um, in Amos 3 and verse, maybe you should turn to the scriptures, I'm probably misquoting them. Let's come across to Amos. And it speaks about the Lord um, in a sense of the, an attitude of a lion or an attitude of roaring, roaring from Zion. Okay, Joel Amos, Hosea Joel Amos, um, Amos chapter 1 and verse 2 says, And he said, The Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And then in Amos chapter 3 and verse 8, the prophet Amos said this, The lion hath roared, who will fear? The Lord hath spoken, who can but prophesy? The lion hath roared who will fear. The Lord hath spoken, who can but prophesy. 
There are times when the gentle, loving voice of the ox is not enough. God needs a lion to roar. There are times when the, the shepherding voice is not sufficient. There are occasions when God wants to speak in power and authority. There are times when a spirit maybe is troubling your home, troubling your kids, troubling your family, and it's not time for a gentle, loving voice. It's time for a prophetic command under the anointing of the spirit to finish the enemy off. A roar. That's not an ox. That's a lion. That's not an eagle. You know, nobody gets afraid when the eagle is screeching up there, but let a lion roar. That's different. And it's an attribute, it's a characteristic boldness in the realm of speaking. Always related to speech. And the church needs the voice of the lion, the roar. So often the church is in confusion with a profusion of all kinds of doctrines and concepts and attitudes and situations and it needs a lion to roar. It needs someone to stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, this is nonsense. And speak the word of the Lord. All kinds of trends and fads catch on in the church which are not of God. And it needs a voice to stand up and say, That's rubbish! Thus saith the Lord. The church vacillates up and down all over the place. All kinds of things happen. And it needs a voice. Without fear, with great boldness. The church needs strong, decisive leadership. The voice of a lion. We need the lion. We need lions who can hear the, hear God's voice and say with courage, thus saith the Lord. A lion has a prophetic mantle. He hears from God and he allows God to roar through him. We have to discern between a quickening from the Lord and a direct communication from him. There is a difference. We have to discern that and, uh, you know, in a quickening from the Lord, a person feels something. And, uh, you know, I just feel the Lord is saying this. I just have this thought. That's fine, but we need more than just a quickening of the Lord. We need, when the voice of the lion speaks, he speaks out of an encounter with God, a direct encounter with the Lord, with the voice of God, and he stands up and declares it. It's more than just a quickening. It's more than just feeling. There's place, there's place for all of that quickenings and feelings and all that kind of thing. But we're talking about a thus saith the Lord. The voice of a lion which changes things, brings order, brings direction. Out of direct communication from God, expressed with a authoritative kingly roar, the roar of a lion. You know, sometimes the lion nature is very misunderstood. It's um, either within a man or within a woman or whatever. The lion nature can be misunderstood. Sometimes it seems aggressive because the lion nature tends to move in revelation gifts and, and have a mantle of authority, particularly in the realm of discerning of spirits. They often have the wor- a word from God and a word from the Lord. And uh, people can resent that. We can be jealous of that. People can fear it. We need to learn to respect it. Because when the lion speaks, that is a roar. And I'm not talking male, female, both. We're talking the nature of a lion can be manifest in either male or female. But when it is manifest, we need to hear what God is saying. We don't fear it. You don't resent it. You respect it. It had a direct communication with authority from God. You have to make room for that and respect it because it is God. Finally, the lion is territorial. He is territorial. And he guards his territory. And it's important to understand this. He will defend his territory. He will also increase his territory. In Numbers 23... It reads like this in Numbers 23 in verse, I think it's verse 23. Yeah, it says, Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, but neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, 
it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel. And it's talking about the occult powers arrayed against us. There is no enchantment in Jacob and Israel. And uh, behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift himself up as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain. There's an interesting verse this because it's in relationship to the occult powers. The uh, verse 23 speaks of the occult powers arrayed against the church and the people of God. And verse 24 speaks of the lion-like nature. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift himself up as a young lion, he shall not lie down until he eat the prey and drink the blood of the slain. He is territorial. He will establish his territory and he will take that and maintain it. And God wants to give us the nature of a lion when it comes to our territory. Your territory can be your home. Okay. Maintaining that as a lion. It's territorial. A lion will not allow any other any other creature to establish its um its home or its abode within his territory. And they get the idea after a while. When he's roared for a while, they tend, don't tend to come in there anyway. But that's his. In God. Anything comes near, he roars. He's territorial. Your home can be the territory which God has given you. And you've got to maintain that with the strength of a lion. It can be a church where we have a territory, a geographical territory. I believe God has given us a geographical territory in this city. I believe it. We haven't taken it yet. And there's going to be some fights, but we're going to take it. The occult have marked out this city and all their boundaries. Big deal. I haven't seen anything yet. God's people are about to mark it out. Hallelujah. Take this city for God. No divination, no enchantment, no occult powers can stand against the lion. They will rise up and spoil its power. They're in for a shock. There have been a tremendous battles over this city of light. God has a special purpose for it. And it's our territory. God placed us in the city. It is our territory. Hallelujah. And we're going to take it and we're going to maintain it. But it can only be taken. Not by the shepherd. Not with the ox. Not necessarily with the eagle. It can only be taken with the lion. That's the kind of nature that will take it. Hallelujah. Strong. Establishing the territory. And taking the, li taking the land. Sons of God as a lion. Still a man, at times an ox, serving, working. At times an eagle soaring into the realms of the spirit. Touching God in those, in those heavenly realms. But he is also a lion. Hallelujah. He doesn't know any fear. Conquered the giant of fear within his life. Strong, without fear, bold in the prophetic sense. Gets direct communication from God. Says, thus saith the Lord. Moves in the revelation gives. With authority and power. Has strength in his spirit. It's territorial. Knows what God has given him. Will fight for it and then will defend it. And hold it. The profile of a lion. And in all of you, within the sphere of your activity and calling, God wants to develop the lion nature. It may not be a predominant thing within your life, but in the sphere of your calling, there are times when you're going to have to be a lion, or a lioness, or whatever you, you want to be. And you're going to have to take that stand in God and manifest these attributes and take your stand without fear, without backing off, and deal with the power of the enemy. A lion. How much of the lion is there in you? How much of the lion has been developed within you in the realms of the spirit, these attributes of God? I want to tell you, when, when, when the prophet 
get up on the mountain and all the prophets of Baal were there, Elijah and all the prophets of Baal were there doing their thing and Israel was going to the pot he got up on the mountain he said it's enough and he roared as a lion and hundreds of them were slain and the whole of Israel came back from idolatry to serving the one true God because a lion stood up and said enough is enough and began to roar and with strength and with power he called fire down from heaven and changed the whole scene in Israel. We need more lions in leadership, strong leadership that hears from God in the church of Jesus Christ and his courage, has enough courage to say, Thus saith the Lord. There's enough courage to go against the stream and say, Thus saith the Lord. And stand and roar as a lion. Developing that characteristic within your life, an aspect of the nature of God within you, until a well-rounded person with full profiles in these last days manifesting four aspects of the life of Jesus, M maturing into sons of God, in maturity who will stand in the earth in these last days as an eagle, as an ox, as a man, and as a lion, developing the nature within you. You say, well, I'm not called to be a lion. I want to tell you, when the enemy starts causing havoc in your home, it's time, mother, that you were a lioness in the spirit. It's time, father, that you became a lion. Sure, you can be an ox, but you can't be an ox all the time. You can't be a lion all the time. You can't be an eagle all the time. That's boring. But there are times when you have to be a lion. You have to know and develop that side of your nature of Christ within you. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. Oh, the lion's my favorite out of all this lot. You can get so much done in so short a time. But you have to develop that nature. Let's pray, shall we? Father, I just pray tonight that Lord, out of this series, and we've considered these four aspects, profiles of the sons of God, four faces of the sons of God in the last days, and we've considered each of their natures and each of their characteristics and how you're seeking to develop measures of them all within our lives. In whatever our sphere of calling and activity and involvement is, we need measures, Lord, of these profiles, these characteristics outworked within our lives. We will always be men and women, but at times we need to be like the eagle, catch the wind of the Spirit, and soar above the storm, learning how to ride out the storm in these end times. You need to understand the nature and the characteristic of an ox to serve and to work and to minister to others. Levels of service. We need to know how to be like a lion. Help us, Lord, to identify these areas within our life where you're working and training and preparing and getting us ready and maturing us in these areas that we might learn to function in them efficiently in the spirit to stand as a whole person ready to do the will of God ready for the final conflict in these end times ready to bring in the kingdom of God Lord, we live in such a confused world with many voices. We live in a confused, we see the church confused with so many voices. 
and it's time for the voice of the lion to roar. Say, thus saith the Lord. And bring order and direction, breaking the confusion, and bring a, bringing authority and decisive leadership into the body of Christ. The voice of the lion. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Some of you need to develop that. There are situations in your life, circumstances, family, homes, when you need, you come to the place where you say, enough is enough. The lion roars. And that power is broken. And order is restored. Peace is restored. And the will of God is done because the lion roared. 